The other day, a young friend asked me how I felt about the assassination of Adolf Hitler. I said, what? He said, it's true, I've just seen the movie. Well, I didn't want to get into a heavy discussion about the current vogue of revisionist revenge movies, so I just said, eh, Hollywood's been altering history for years. Robert Stroud, American, a convict, a paradox of a man who has lived in an aura of violence, yet who out of defiance and sheer strength of will taught himself in a prison cell half a dozen languages and mastered the intricacies of a score of scientific subjects an accomplishment to stagger the imagination. You think Stroud's quite a man, don't you? I think he's a genius. He may have written a fabulous book on bird diseases, but as a fellow Alcatraz inmate once said, Stroud was a vicious killer. Bert Lancaster owes us an apology. He is English. He is 21. His name is John Merrick. At no time have I met with such a perverted or degraded version of a human being as this man. Might have assumed then that he is ultimately incurable. Joseph, not John Merrick, was not a victim of his deformity, but the master of it. Brilliant at marketing, he merchandised himself and died a wealthy man. I am not an animal. I am a human being. You're the top. And only in Hollywood could a gay musical socialite be transformed into an ex-army veteran and a ladies' man. Do you always kiss women first and speak to them afterwards? If possible. Merry Christmas, Cole Porter. I once heard that Cole Porter said, yes, I'll let you make a movie about my life, but I have to be played by Cary Grant. Now, look, in defense of all storytellers, history's messy. Stories, narratives, are not. They're little packages tied up with ribbon with a beginning, a middle, and an end. And they have their own rules. Rule number one is no coincidences unless you're William Shakespeare writing something like Romeo and Juliet. Or Charles Dickens, where Mr. Brownlow, who rescues Oliver Twist from the evil Fagin, turns out to be related to his brother's sister, I think. And Victor Hugo, whose justice-obsessed police inspector Javert happens to spot his arch-enemy Jean Valjean simply by chance. Wretchedness and nothingness. Alive? What are you talking about? So no coincidences. They do happen in real life, but writers don't like them, audiences don't believe them. Otherwise, the gloves are off. Based on Cornelius Ryan's international bestseller... The story of the most dramatic and devastating battle of World War II. When the scriptwriter William Goldman was given the job of adapting A Bridge Too Far for the big screen, he admitted he had to leave out several heroic episodes because the audience simply wouldn't believe him. So he wrote in a number of more credible, less factual, plausible, fictional events. So it appears you can change historical facts in movies to heighten the drama. I said never stop fighting till the fight is done. Elliot Ness never confronted Al Capone in a courtroom. But it's great fun, isn't it? Here ended the lesson. Ready to fire the town on your order, sir. The town? <laughs> Burn the church. Less fun is malevolent propaganda like this. There's no honor in this. Didn't you say all those who stand against England deserve to die a traitor's death? No churches were burned in the American War of Independence by either side. This scene was based on a crime when Nazis burned a church full of French women alive in World War II. And as we're on the subject of World War II and the It Never Happened department, how about Winston Churchill riding on the London Underground? The historical advisor on this film, Darkest Hour, admitted a little diplomatically that the film's director Quotes, put drama ahead of historical accuracy. Churchill never rode on the tube. Now look here. Just who the jolly heck are you? Lieutenant Winston Churchill, the U.S. Marines. You got a problem with that, pal? Now the reason why that is funny is because it perfectly satirizes the image of the great man created by Hollywood with a little help from the British film industry. 
If we're to believe the movie makers, and I exaggerate for effect, Winston Churchill single-handedly fought the Battle of Britain, braved U-boats in the North Atlantic, defeated Rommel in the desert, even broke the top-secret German Enigma code. It's got uh, 16 billion different combinations. The whole of Western Europe's been trying to figure this out. They can't do it. I just... Wait a second. What's Hitler's birthday? April 19th, 1898. Okay, let's give it a shot. Four, one, nine, one, eight... Nine, eight. Press return. Port! Thanks to short memories and Hollywood narratives, Churchill's become a parody, a meme. A, a black hat, a coat, a cigar, and a string of quotable quotes. We stand at a crossroads, Doctor, quite alone, with our backs to the wall. Invasion is expected daily. After his death and a decent interval, films began to be made about him. The source material for the early movies was impeccable, it was himself. In fact, those books. The Second World War in six volumes provided the script for a Richard Burton documentary. There was a white glow, overpowering, sublime, which ran through our island from end to end. Thus began Dunkirk. A great tide of small vessels began to flow towards the sea, first to our channel ports and thence to the beaches of Dunkirk and the beloved army. In the 1970s, people grew tired of this image of Churchill, the indomitable war leader. They wanted something a little more, quote, real. The question is, did the filmmakers do that by simply making stuff up? For instance, here's a scene from a popular TV series starring Robert Hardy, Churchill the Wilderness Years, in which the American media mogul William Randolph Hearst offers Winston a job. Well, maybe, maybe you could write a few articles for us, telling the American people all about British politics, Winston. Wow. Well, could you retain editorial control? <laughs> well, of course. And you retain several thousand dollars. That's a fair bargain, is it not? That sounds pretretty good to me, sir. That's where all the money goes. A domestic scene. The dialogue almost certainly imagined between Winston and his wife Clementine. You knew I didn't like it and you deliberately deceived me. That's not true. I never saw such an ugly house. Come with me. That's why I bought it. Not because the house is beautiful, but because of that. What you can see from the house. England. Look at it, Clemmy. Nowhere in the world would you find a landscape more ravishing than that. And it's ours. To look at and to cherish for the rest of our lives. I would die for it, Clemmy. Inspiring, you'll agree, but once again, who is there to verify this exchange? And I'll say this again, in defense of Hollywood and scriptwriters and movie makers, history is messy. Robert Stroud, the Birdman of Alcatraz, was both a cold-blooded killer and an expert on bird diseases. Joseph Merrick, the Elephant Man, was both the victim and the hero of his condition. Winston Churchill was not a perfect man, but he did save civilization from the horrors of Hitler, who wasn't assassinated in a theatre, by the way, but died by his own hand in a bunker in Berlin. And come to think of it... Did Salieri do it after all? Did he murder Amadeus? Salieri didn't murder Mozart. Born on a mountaintop in Tennessee. Davy Crockett was born in a valley, not on a mountaintop. The French queen, Marie Antoinette, favoured bright colours, not pastels. Mary, Queen of Scots, never met Elizabeth I, and anyway... Do not play into their hands. Our enmity is precisely what they hope for. She had a French accent, not a Scottish one. Marcus Aurelius, played here by Richard Harris, was not smothered to death by his son Commodus. He actually died a natural death at the age of 58. Mary was older, not younger, than her sister, Anne Boleyn. And King Arthur was not a Roman soldier with a warrior princess wife. Kill him! They were protecting Camelot, which last I heard was in Tintagel in sunny Cornwall. And Krakatoa is west of Java, not east.
Okay, so call me old-fashioned, dear Hollywood, but your approach to the truth and your sloppiness to detail are appalling. Don't you think you have a responsibility both to the people you represent on screen and to the people who are eating your popcorn? Me? If I want entertainment for now, I'll go to the movies. If I want history, I'll read a book.